Welcome uh, to Automation Masterclass, Unlocking Automation from Setup to Success. So I'm Marcus Kishota. I'm co-founder and CSO here at Synthase, and I'll be your host for today's session. Um, I'm excited to introduce our two presenters for today's session, who are Anne and Luke. Anne is a customer success manager at Synthase, so she's got an extensive background in stem cell and tissue engineering and immunology. That's over nine years in research, biotech and automation. And yeah, got a lot of experience in how to get automation set up and really delivering value within various different organizations. And Luke's our sales director here at Synthase with an extensive background himself, working on the intersection of science, software, and hardware in pharma and with a BSc in bioengineering and chemistry. Thank you both for joining us. Anne's going to be kicking things off and I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Marcus. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to some of you. Thank you for joining us today. So this is the agenda. I'm going to cover the first couple of points, which is um, implementation for long-term success. Whose job is it anyway to do this for automation? And then we'll talk about how to get automation from an interim into an integral use, how to handle the human side of automation that we're maybe not as familiar with. And then Luke will tackle a couple of the common challenges we hear about, which are one, this mentality that I can do this faster by hand. I don't need automation. Or two, the learning curve is too steep. I can't learn automation. So let's get started. So if you're here, likely you've just bought an expensive new toy, or maybe you've bought them before, or maybe you have multiple expensive liquid handlers or dispensers. How do we get the most out of it so it doesn't just end up blocking the hallway or taking up space in your lab? So really we're here for the question, implementation for long-term success and automation, whose job is it really anyway? In every company that's looking at automation, there are many stakeholders at play. So these stakeholders could be an automation specialist or an engineer or scientist. So these could be a people who are familiar with automation, but they may or may not have their own project, their own scientific projects ongoing. You have some lab scientists who typically do have their own projects, but they may or may not be familiar with automation. There's a range there. You have typically an IT team or and or a digital solutions team. These, in our experience, can make or break a rollout. Uh, you have project managers sometimes who are often juggling multiple projects at the same time. They're super busy. And then you have managers and directors, leadership team, who typically see the long-term vision for automation, but they're not in the lab, in the trenches, in the day-to-day -day struggles that you might be facing if you're in the lab. And then there are other stakeholders. It could be advisors to your team. You could have interns or co-ops, which are fairly common. Any of these stakeholders or many of them or all of them really could champion automation in your organization. So that's the first question we want to find out is we'll see a poll pop up. Okay. You should see a poll. Okay. We have some quick results coming in and we're seeing over half of the respondents are saying that the experts are the ones who champion automation in your company. So those who are familiar with automation and excited about it. That makes sense. That tracks typically the people who know about it and are excited about it would be the one championing. It makes sense. Uh, the next highest is probably the enthusiast, not so familiar, but still very excited. That's great. We love them. And then the next up is everyone. Everybody could just say, great, good for you. We're very happy to see that. And then we have management or some just you and your own themselves. So let's see if we can help pull that a little bit towards the everyone category. So with so many stakeholders, if there are no clear ownership of tasks and who's doing what, the two things could happen that we want to avoid. One, things don't get done and you end up like the Spider-Man meme where everyone's pointing at each other. Or as sometimes it happens, it just falls onto one person or a few people trying to do everything. And this can lead to burnout or turnover. Some of you might be familiar with that feeling. So really we want to prevent either no one doing anything or one person or a few people doing everything. So how do we prevent that? A few steps. One is get buy-in from stakeholders at every level and get them early. Stakeholders at every level means everyone from those who are using it in the lab to those who are paying for it. And typically everyone in between, everyone who has a stake in what is happening with automation should be committed to the cause and also inform them early that so they can prepare mentally, physically, prepare the lab, everything for it. Secondly, once everybody is in on it together, then figure out who is in charge of what. Make sure everyone is, knows what their roles and responsibilities are. You could use a framework like WACI, so responsible, accountable, consulted, and informed, or there are so many modified types of RACIs, but basically 
any framework that allows people to know what they're responsible for, what they own and what they don't own, and also who owns what part of the project. That's helpful. Thirdly, timeline. So establish a good framework for how to track tasks, how to track your deadlines. Again, there are tons of tools available. Some of you might be prone or more partial perhaps to a Gantt chart. There are Kanban boards as well. Both of those I like a lot. You can do a simple flow chart or even like a checklist. The only thing I will recommend is as you plan out a timeline to include risk management in your planning. And in an ideal world, the instruments are never down. People never get sick. No other products come up but we don't live in an ideal world. So plan for things like instrument downtime, whether maybe something breaks, something crashes, plan for people going on vacation, people going, getting sick, plan for things just to get delayed along the way. And all those should be included as part of your plan so that you can get a clear sense, a clear and sober sense for what is needed and how long it's going to take. So once you have all that, you have your roles, you have your timeline, you have a strategy, where do you go from there? So, our recommendation is to start small and think big. So the process of automation is, let's say you start from a lab where you're doing things by hand with a pipette. You have only a few things you need to keep track of. How do we get from that to automating an entire workflow or at least most of the workflow? If you've done this before, you know that it takes a set of very deliberate intentional steps. You have to consider how many samples do I have? If I have a lot, maybe I need to think of a more efficient way to get them from one plate to another or one point to another. Where do they go? Maybe I should write a script to get it on the automation platform. And then I want to make sure nothing crashes. So I watch it really closely. And then when it's all said and done and everything runs well, what do I do with all of the data that I've generated? If you're familiar with that step, now take a step back and think about now if you're trying to automate multiple processes, we've now expanded the scope of what we're trying to do here. So getting the most out of your automation is the same, but just much bigger. So instead of thinking, how many samples do I have? You're now thinking, where are all of my samples going to come from? Uh, instead of thinking, I finished my experiment, where does the data go? It's now, where does all of the data go from all of the experiments? So do we track all the changes in the scripts that we've made, version control, uh, maybe deck layout changes, labware changes. How do we name them in a way that everybody knows what's happening? All these little details you have to think about. Otherwise, these problems start to snowball as you get more and more uh, projects underway. And also, how do we identify and rectify errors quickly before they snowball? For those of you who have worked in large organizations on very complex products before, you know that experiments get more complex, more iterative. And you have more collaboration across different departments, different sites, sometimes even different companies and organizations. Data management becomes so important. So you might consider something like an ELN or a LIM system to track all your samples and even all of your data at the very end to pull it into a closed loop. You might want to consider execution tracking. So how do you know if something's gone wrong? How do you find out what has gone wrong? Um, you might want to consider something like error reporting. So if you, that way you can track errors that come up and also identify patterns, if there are any patterns that start to emerge. So maybe we do start small. Let's say we start with a very small automated assay, start with the low hanging fruit of automation, as we call it. So this could be a dilution, maybe an aliquot, maybe a bunch of normalizations, just to get people into the mindset of automation. It's a bit like a kiddie pool or like a bunny slope, depending on what sport you relate to the most. Then you can build on it, build on to bigger and more complex projects. Maybe that's the black diamond slope or the, I don't know, the Olympic pool, whatever it is that makes sense to you. The power of, of what we've seen in a success story or a proof of concept, sometimes called a proof point experiment, is that once you've completed that, it's small, it's manageable, but also it could help to inform your strategy or your enablement process. So in, an enablement process is a strategy basically to provide people what they need to succeed. So once you've done your proof of concept or your success story, you can use the lessons learned there to inform things like your overall strategy or automation plan. Meaning now that we've done this small experiment, how has our understanding of what we can achieve changed? Has it changed? Have our timelines changed? You can use it to inform your onboarding programs. How do we make sure that people can learn this without being overburdened by the tasks? You can use it to inform your training content and even format. Are videos best? Are articles best? Courses? How long do people take to learn new things? You can use it to inform your data strategy. How do you ensure at the end of the day that you can have confidence in your data? How do you query your data in the future? 
You can also use it to inform your understanding of the risks for this entire project. So this is where feedback really comes in handy. Make sure you track metrics so that you know some of the risks that might be coming your way. So learning some of these lessons from a small proof point experiment can help you transition from a small success story to a wider use and hopefully many more success stories. And this process could be iterative. So the first round that you do it, get as much feedback as you can, track as many metrics as you can. Things like how long does it take on average somebody to learn a new skill in automation? What were the things that helped them to learn this new skill? What were the things that made it difficult? What were the pain points for them learning these new skills? How did our current process help to encourage or maybe hinder collaboration between teams, between sites? And as you are able to look at this process from the perspective of your different stakeholders, remember we have so many stakeholders, right? So how does a beginner view this process? How does an automation expert perhaps view this process? You might have people in your team or company that don't believe in automation, that don't want to do automation. What are their pushback? What are their objections? And they might have some valid points that you can learn from, right? What is management going to do about it? Chances are, if you bought something very expensive, management was involved in that. They had to sign off on that. So what are the things they are looking out for in order to assess whether this was successful or not? So as we understand the perspectives of these different stakeholders, that brings us to change management. So change management is basically of saying, um, a describing a framework for managing the people end of change. We know that technology moves really fast, faster than most of us can even keep track of. But human psychology is naturally a little bit resistant to change. It doesn't mean that it's bad. It doesn't mean that it's not possible to change, but it just means that it takes a bit of intentionality, effort and understanding of human behavior to be able to engender change in a large organization. So there are many models out there. I'm not going to go through all of them, but basically if you boil them all down to the change management framework components, it's a skeleton of three basic components. There's a before, a doing, and an after. Very simple. So the before is how do you define or measure success? How will we know if we have automated in our organization? How will this change people's lives? Who will this change or impact their jobs in their day-to-day? -day? How are we going to achieve this? How are we going to approach changing, making some changes in the way we automate and think about our processes in the lab? But the second one is the doing part. So how do we manage this change? How do we prepare or support or engage people as they're going through this transition? Something to know here, we know from our industry report that people are overwhelmed, scientists are overwhelmed. So if people are going to, scientists or engineers are going to take on new tasks, such as learning a new programming language, learning a new um, software or hardware, then maybe their other workload have to be adjusted a little bit. So they're not, we're not just adding 10 hours of work to a 40 hour work week, but maybe things need to be balanced out a little bit to support them through this process. Also, how do we track the process in the middle, in the thick of all of it? How do we know if we're going in the right direction? And what do we need to adapt for the future if we have to do this again, when we have to do this again? And the last is after. So after this change has happened, after you've implemented automation, are we done? Did the automation get successfully implemented? Are we confident that this can be sustained and maintained in the long term? And if so, who owns it now? Is it the same team that did the change management or does it now pass on to somebody else to own and to manage? Like I mentioned, there are many change management models out there. I'm just going to list a few here. Feel free to look them up on your own. Uh, the most common one you might've heard of is probably ADCOR. So this stands for Awareness, Desire, Knowledge, Ability, and Reinforcement. It basically models what has to happen psychologically for change to happen. Um, the McKinsey company, which is a consulting firm, has many different models. Feel free to look them up as well. There's the Kubler-Ross Kubler curve. So some of you might have heard of Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who first championed the stages of grief. Fun fact of the day, those stages are also used to model how humans adapt to change and respond to changes that are being imposed. So that is something you can look into if you want. Fun psychology fact of the day. If you're part of a really large organization, you might want to use a ramped model. So something like the SAMR model, for example, which stands for uh, substitution, augmentation, modification, and redefinition. So this is when, let's say you have a thousand people in an organization or even a few hundred, it's infeasible to put everybody through the same change process at the same time. It feels a bit like chaos. So you might want to split them up into different groups and put them through different stages of it at the same time. So something that we like to do, for example, is to have a super user model where you put a small group of super users through the change process first, 
learn from that, put the general users through, and then maybe rethink in the future as you onboard new employees, as you bring on more collaborators, how do you train them in an ongoing, sustainable way? So wherever you are today on the automation journey, if you're just starting, just bought a shiny new toy, or if you have many of them and you've been on this journey for a long time, my hope is that if you keep these frameworks in mind, you might be able to see some small changes in your lab. Maybe automation starts becoming part of the daily vernacular and muscle memory of the group. So maybe people start to be more open to automation and start to think about things that they could automate in their daily lives. And then maybe you move on in the next step to entering an automation first paradigm. So maybe people start thinking about how do we build protocols on automation first rather than having to transfer it later. At the end of this journey, my hope for you is that you can get the most out of that expensive new toy that you just bought. And these tools and tips hopefully will help you to bring automation from an intermittent project that you use sometimes to an integral part of your lab processes. And change is hard, but you got this. I believe in you. So that brings us to our next poll, which is what does your lab use automation for? Oh, okay. Very cool. Thank you for those who, um, thank you to those who answered the poll. So we're seeing again, more than half of people are saying that their lab uses automation for specific or bespoke projects. Uh, about a quarter of the respondents say your lab uses automation for everything under the sun. That's fantastic. And then about even numbers for basic liquid handling or nothing yet. So hopefully this will be helpful. Something I said today might be helpful to you, but now I'll hand it over to Luke and talk through a couple of the common objections to automation that we hear about. Fantastic. And I think it's actually a good segue into this, this second portion around objection handling a little bit with, I would say maybe the, the group that once automation is in place can be the most critical group because they are a key stakeholder in actually performing experiments and wanting to use automation to generate the data that's going to drive your organization. And did a great job talking about implementation of automation and how to make it successful. And so what I'm going to be covering now is what are some common challenges that we encounter in adoption by stakeholders? And what's interesting is that what I would say is the biggest arguments revolve around a single subject matter. And that happens to be time investment. And so one of the ones that we're going to be tackling here is this idea of things can be done faster by hand, depending on what you're working on within the lab. And what's interesting about this too, is that the faster by hand mentality may not actually be so much about how long it takes to carry something out, but rather more of this comfort of how things have already always been done and how they know to be done. And so it ties into that idea of change management as well as being very important. But to tackle the argument specifically, I would say around time that's brought up with being done faster by hand, this mentality tends to be very in the moment thinking. And it dissociates the act of performing the experiment from all the other components that are actually involved in making a successful and efficient experiment. So really what I'm saying is it misses the bigger picture here. So if we widen our view of an experiment beyond just performing a single task here, it's not just about pipetting. Really, it's about a series of tasks that ultimately make this one thing slower. So if we look at the wider view, it involves documentation and data management of IP for various purposes, gathering the context of the experiments and the conclusions that can be drawn. And automation allows for unambiguous record keeping of all of this. It's the sample tracking that can become more difficult as things get larger and we scale and being able to actually accumulate all of that information and make sure that it's not issue ridden as that scale increases. And not only is this experiment just about carrying it out in the moment, as I mentioned, but it's the fact that no matter who or what performs the experiment, it needs to be reproducible. So does the pipette that you're holding do the same thing that your colleague is holding? Do you pipette the same way that your colleague does? And this can also lead into human error. And so maybe you got distracted because your manager walked by, popped in the lab to ask you a question, and you can't remember whether you added a reagent or not. And that nervousness just threw off your accuracy and your precision. So when we think about this mentality of doing it faster by hand, we really have to keep in scope 
everything that's involved from the very beginning to the end of an experiment. Now, I will say, if we want to hinge this, so just strictly on performing an experiment within the lab and the sole factor of time savings, there really still is a bigger picture that can be captured here. And that is looking at time savings over a period of time, not just within that instance. So I want to take a moment to look at a real life example where a client of mine was performing sample prep for an assay about three times a week by hand. And on average, he told me it took 30 minutes to calculate out all the necessary transfers and perform the sample prep just by hand. Alternatively though, when he set this up with automation, it took him 45 minutes to program the automation, five minutes to set up the deck and all the materials, and then 10 for it to actually go through the process of prepping those samples. So I am huge on um, figures and visualization. So I, I put some of this together here um, into a graph, right? Tracking this progress both by hand as well as by automation. So in the pink here, you can see the time cumulatively as this assay prep is being performed during various iterations over time, and then in purple, the same with automation. And so we knew that the automation took a bit of time to program up front, and we have to set things up every time. But what we can see is that in this mindset of performing the sample prep three times a week, already by the end of the first week, we've broken even between the two different approaches. And now as we enter the second week, we're already seeing time savings. Now, if we extend this to a full year, and we'll say 50 weeks, not 52, we have to account for the two weeks where he's in the Bahamas vacationing, right? That means that we're looking at annually 150 sample preps that are performed. So when we scale this, we really see two highlighted points here of time savings. The first is what I'm showing here, where between the manual and automation, we actually have almost an entire week of time that saved just by performing this through automation. And when you think about that, think of sitting at your desk for five, eight hour days. That's a lot of time that's actually being saved where other things can be done. Now, on top of that, one thing that I haven't really touched upon is something that's typically referred to as walkaway time. And this is that time in this specific case, those 10 minutes where the automation is actually doing the sample prep. The scientist doesn't have to do anything in that moment. So that's actually a time where while the sample prep is being performed simultaneously, they can be carrying out other things or if you need a break, go grab a coffee. But it's additional time savings that many times is not accounted for. And I like to think of it um, I travel a lot, so I fly. I'm big into rewards programs. I like to think of it as your personal lab rewards program. The more that you invest into using automation, the more of this walkaway time that you have to go off and do other things while your work is still being performed by automation within the lab. So when we break this down just over this particular use case, right, we're only looking at a single scientist in a year. So we can multiply a lot of this as well. But one scientist, what it typically took them 30 minutes to do by manual sample prep, they were able to cut down in terms of time by 49% to get that sample prep prepared. And then also actually freed up three days for them to do other things throughout the year because of that walk away time. The second one that I want to touch on that has to do with time as well as an objection is conquering the learning curve. And this really has to do with learning how to program and use automation within the lab. Now, we might have a mixed bag of audience members when it comes to this webinar. And so some of you may have looked at my timing of 45 minutes to program automation and said, yep, that's me. I'm an expert. I know exactly how to do that. Others may have looked at it and said, how could you get that down to 45 minutes just to program that? And so I want to touch upon that in regards to actually being able to efficiently learn and use automation in this learning curve. So it doesn't really have so much to do really with conquering the learning curve in terms of what I'll talk about. But in fact, it's easier than conquering it. It's making that curve smaller and smaller. 
And we're going to get just a little sciency within this one by drumming up the topic of activation energy. So what I'm showing here on the left hand side is we have a piece of hardware that's on the top and we need to connect that um, and run it through programming it through software. Now that software has to be learned, right? So if we think about it, there's an investment of time and energy from each end user who wants to use this automation that they want to uh, employ to make their work more useful and efficient. So you have to actually invest this time and energy up front um, to reach this more stable state where you can see these benefits of efficiency. But it can be quite a big effort and overhaul to get over that activation energy curve. And when we think about expanding automation to more and more uses, we actually have to go through this cycle multiple times, especially in the case where we start adding newer devices in, incorporate a different one, different device with different capabilities, different software that has to be learned. And so this activation energy we encounter throughout this process a number of times, and over time that can wear down on us. So what do we need in this case? To continue along with this theme, we need a catalyst. And so a catalyst here is going to make this learning process easier and faster so that others can quickly jump on and adopt this as well as see the benefits with really a simpler course um, throughout this kind of time scale. So in this case, it's the software that simplifies the user experience. Now keep in mind, automation vendors are focused on delivering the capabilities and features of their hardware. They may not be so focused about how users have to interact with their software in order to actually run those capabilities. However, if the goal is to get more users to actually adopt automation, then what we need to do is focus on lowering um, that energy that's required to get there. Hence, in this case, what I'm referring to is Synthase acting as a catalyst by introducing an interface where it's much easier to understand and doesn't require the end user to learn how to code and program for their automation. And if we again extend this to the idea of incorporating more and more automation, you remove those endless cycles of training and activation energy that someone has to go through. So it's like a one software to rule them all type of approach up front where mastering of synthase then applies to all of these new devices that you are bringing into the lab. Well, what if those new devices are the same anyways? We just bought another one of what we had before. Okay, but I guess I would question then, is the depth the same? Does it have the same configuration, the same software version, the same multi-channel, the same labware? All of these little intricacies and details that have to be accounted for still roll into this activation energy. And they can be a debt by a thousand cuts, but we can easily address them within Synthase without having to go through those unnecessary headaches. So overcoming the challenge of a learning curve isn't really so much about motivation anymore to get people so enthusiastic necessarily, but rather making it easier for adoption. In essence, trying to minimize the learning curves altogether. So those are the two that I really wanted to address, especially from those key stakeholders as scientists and engineers in the lab, who are the ones that need to approach automation and utilize it to really see the value in its use within an organization. So I just wanted to do a kind of a quick review over this past session, the topics that we covered here, and I think did a great job showcasing that there can be multiple stakeholders in implementing automation. And it's really important to understand the roles and responsibilities of everyone who's involved, as well as being able to plan for success by starting with those smaller wins and building the momentum and the understanding of how automation is used and best practices, but then rolling that into the bigger picture that you might have in mind for your organization. What I wanted to touch on was really addressing those concerns from end users, like the faster by hand mentality, by showing that even a, a single piece of work that might seem very simple and fast to do by hand, like sample prep, actually gets done quicker with automation when we look at it in the larger scope of both the experiment as well as an entire time scale. In this case, where we looked at a full year of sample prep. And then lastly, that adopting automation 
shouldn't just be forcing users to go through some grueling training where they may just get sick of it half the way through, but rather lowering that barrier to make it easier to get through this activation energy where automation benefits can be seen much quicker and they're realized by the end users uh, so that they want to adopt more and more and incorporate it into their work. So with that, I think um, we are going to be moving on to some Q&A. Thank you very much, Bo. Um, thank you, Luke. Thank you, Anne. I'm bringing them back online so we can uh, have some questions. So we received a few questions while we've been going along. Um, if you didn't uh, um, ask your question yet, then you know, can take some time while we're in this Q&A session to, to put it in the chat and we'll field it. If we don't manage to get to your question, then uh, we'll often try and answer these after the event, either in person or on our blog in upcoming months or in, even in future webinars. Let's dive in. Um, actually, this first question is one that we uh, get quite a lot in person when we're chatting with people. Um, and it could be that people are um, looking for what their first bit of automation might be to get started with. And it's actually a very generic question. It's basically, what advice do you have for deciding what automation to purchase? Um, that's a good question. I think I would hinge this one really out of the topic that we just came off of. And I would maybe even challenge saying, rather than looking necessarily at the hardware first, maybe the software. And what's going to be something that you think is easier for people to pick up? Now, I, I'm not going to set aside by any means that when you're looking at hardware, you need to understand that the capabilities and features are there of the hardware to run what you need for your specific work. But just in the mindset of once that's implemented, how are you going to ensure that you have users who are going to utilize that hardware? So right. I guess my answer to the question is, Clearly looking at capabilities and features, but I wouldn't point to a specific piece of hardware. I would say, look at the software. Right. I, I think there's an interesting follow on to that actually. And, and that is just the approachability of different bits of hardware as well. We've been talking a huge amount about change management here. And I think it's uh, really cool that you guys chose to focus on that because certainly when I was first looking at this and the journey I've been on is I thought it was all about the science, it's all about the technology. And then you realize that if nobody's actually adopting it, then what's the point? So it's, it's so, super important to think about that approachability. And we've seen that there are some bits of automation where if you're thinking of starting small and then building from there, it might make sense to actually go for some of these much more approachable things, both in terms of they're just physical imposing this and, and, and evident complexity. And obviously, as, as Luke mentioned, the kind of software that you'd need to run it. Yeah, I would just add to that too. The other side of the coin, to that is you also want to purchase something that you can, that is fit for purpose now, but also will be useful in the future. So not to add more complexity to this decision-making process, but also sometimes you might consider this is what I need today, but in three years time, this is how we're planning to grow. And so having that mindset of what will be a good investment, what is something that we can grow into. So it needs to walk the balance between being approachable now, but also still being useful in the future. So okay. it, then I think different groups will wait in terms of what's more important to you because you might just get a second piece of automation later. And so maybe that won't be a problem. But depending on the size of the group, uh, you might have budget considerations as well. Yeah, and certainly on that point as well about this idea of trying to future proof a little bit. I think often the temptation that I've seen in, in lots of different places is they'll go for a big, ambitious end to end uh, piece of automation from the outset. And obviously that's increasing your risk in the first instance, if, if that's your first automation project as a company. But it also tends to mean that uh, you're assuming that specific use case that you're using it for it now will also apply in future. Um, I personally have seen way too many uh, sort of automation graveyards in companies where, you know, either that use case has, has moved on or you can end up with actually just those people moving on as well. And then the, that very specific purpose just isn't as relevant as it might have been at one point. Okay. We've got a question here. What are the most important skills to acquire when switching from a lab researcher role to an automation specialist role? That's a really good question. I guess as I'm thinking about this, and I, I might be changing the, 
<laughs> the question a little bit. I'm actually more thinking about what benefit are you already adding rather than the skills that you need to acquire in the sense that I think one of the biggest gaps that I see in the use of automation is not being able to communicate effectively between a scientist and an automation specialist. The content and the intent behind an experiment that's once performed and translating that into the automation and how that's going to run. I know I'm not exactly answering that question, but I'm saying you're actually providing a benefit <laughs> if you are moving from the role of a scientist into an automation specialist. I think maybe the one skill that I would throw out in terms of learning is focusing a bit more maybe on data handling and management because Anne touched on this, but after an experiment, automation gives that ability to scale. And so with that becomes a problem with a lot of data and how do we handle that and how do we track it? Yeah. Right. I would um, absolutely agree with that. The data management piece like so quickly snowballs into just a behemoth. So definitely data management. I assume whoever's asked this that you've already thought about like hardware, software skills, like learning how to script a liquid handler, et cetera. I would also perhaps mention working with liquid classes. So when you work in a lab without automation, you don't have to think about liquid classes as much. But once you're in automation, then liquid classes quickly balloons into a large part of your job. Uh, I certainly had that experience when I used to also go from a scientist to an automation specialist. And then the last one is honestly just patience. This I know sounds very like generic and very fluffy in the sky, but things will take a little bit longer at the beginning, especially as you're getting into it. So just have patience and gentleness with yourself that you're trying to, you've now gone from thinking like a human to thinking like a robot. So it's like learning a whole new lesson. Thinking like a robot. Nice. Yeah, I, I think uh, I would completely echo that. I think it's, there are just some very protocol based practicalities. There'll be things that you're doing when you're doing things manually, which just robots just won't do unless you explicitly tell them to. There's a huge amount of things that we learn as we develop as lab scientists which we almost don't even realize we're doing when we're doing pipetting. And so when Anne's talking about liquid classes, this is essentially how do we make sure that these liquids can be transferred from one place to another with reliability, with reproducibility, with accuracy and precision, irrespective of when they're super gloopy or when they're tile or, or whatever. Yeah, I, I, I think that from what I've seen and what I've experienced is actually about just allowing that time to play with the system, to see what works, to what, 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 what doesn't work. There'll be all sorts of things that you won't necessarily be able to predict up from, um, which will be challenges in, in moving things from uh, manual to automated and as you just gain experience of those kind of things. And you've got a, another sort of related question here is again, talking about this activation energy. If my team already has someone dedicated to automation, do the rest of us really need to learn how to use it? A bit of a challenging one that one. I would say yes, need <laughs> for <laughs> a couple of reasons. I guess number one is the automation specialist, going back to this actual communication and context portion as well, the automation specialist may not understand everything that you intend to do with automation, right? So if you can lay your hand down and come to play at the table and learn how to use the automation, then you can, in a sense, push your agenda a little bit as an individual for the type of work that you're looking to do. On top of that as well, what happens when that automation specialist leaves, right? There's a gap that's left there. And does that mean that either someone internally has to be trained and gain that expertise, or do we bring in someone new from the outside? And so I think if there's more of a communal effort of everyone being engaged with automation and understanding it, maybe not to an expert level, but understanding kind of its basic use, then that gap won't be felt um, so harshly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Definitely. And we go back to talking about risk management a lot, right? Like Luke mentioned, if somebody gets sick, goes on parental leave, finds another job, what happens that gets promoted and is now no longer in your lab? So it's always good, I think, to have some base level knowledge of it. Now, do you need to have the same level of understanding as a subject matter expert might need to have an automation? Maybe not, depending on your role and how the team works. But a way that 
that you like at some days the way some of, of the ways in which we do enablement for automation for anything complex like a methodology is we use a super user model. So this could mean that you have people in your lab who are subject matter experts, who are super users, and they can live, breathe, eat, sleep, talk, automation. Not everybody can do that, and that's fine. But it is helpful to have some to have everybody else have a base level of being able to execute things on the automated platform. Otherwise, what can happen is we've seen it's just bottlenecks where 20 scientists go to the same few automation specialists asking the same questions, and then it quickly becomes a bottleneck and it's very frustrating and stressful for everybody involved. So I do recommend just in terms of long-term planning, risk management, all of those things to start picking up bits of automation, even just to like how to turn it on. If there's an error and it's ringing at you, what do you do? Well, start there and then you can build out knowledge as you go. And I think you bring up a good point too, just maybe also put yourself in the shoes of the automation specialist. If you are the only one and you have 20 people coming to you demanding that you help them with their work, that's a huge amount of stress and work that's now placed on your shoulders. So maybe as a, another individual who isn't the automation specialist, learning some of those more basic skills where you can tackle and accomplish stuff on your own without having to use the specialist would be helpful. <laughs> But then all of this then does make me think right back to the beginning of the talk, which is getting buy-in from everybody because people need time to learn this stuff, right? Or what you guys have just outlined is completely right, but it also is, is like almost the ideal case, right? Is where everybody has the time to actually put in. And the only way they'll get that time is if actually like the higher level stakeholders in particular are bought in and they're explicitly saying, look, guys, we don't want to have the risk of this all being on one person's shoulders. We do want everybody to have a base level. And so therefore, um, we're going to uh, make it an explicit objective for people, but also um, allow that time so that people can actually engage with it properly. Add one uh, thing, something that we've talked about in our industry report, I've mentioned briefly as well, and we've heard this kind of anecdotally in the people that we talk to, is this idea of substituting work rather than just adding work. If we're, for example, expecting scientists to learn automation or automation engineers to like learn some bit of science, then we're adding to their already pretty heavy workload. And so maybe this is just like a broad PSA slash appeal to all the land managers out there to show some mercy. If, if we're going to add someone has <laughs> workload on them, maybe tricks take them off. Yeah, show mercy. Because ultimately, the whole reason that this is happening is ultimately to get a lot of efficiency gains and to get a lot of payback, as Luca outlined, right? So long as everyone's bought into that, then there should be time made for that initial investment across the board. But yeah, it could get pretty painful um, if that's not properly thought about from the outset. Um, okay, I think we've got uh, time for one more question, given the amount that we're diving into these. And this is quite an interesting one. So um, should we first work on the digitalization of the current lab apparatus? Uh, into an ELN or digital systems before jumping into automation. So I guess it's the, it is the idea that you know, there's lots of different bits of equipment in the lab and should we be digitally integrating those other bits of equipment before looking to use automation? And it's basically saying these apparatus wouldn't be part of an automation system anyway. So should we be focusing on that bit first? I think on this one, I'm going to go back to data again, just because I'm trying to think of the overall flow of the work and the data that's created and how you imagine digitizing that and putting it into something like an ELN. I guess my concern upon digitizing maybe upfront without having the automation there is that there's going to be an overhaul of work of what that workflow is going to look like in terms of going through the experimentation, using what's already there, getting that information into the ELN, and then there's going to be a second overhaul when automation comes in. So I don't know if I have the right answer to say that it necessarily should be one way or another, and I don't know what the gap would be in terms of timing, but just understanding that the two workflows are likely going to look very different when it comes to handling and managing that data. So which would you like to tackle first? Yeah, I guess I am not entirely certain why they have, why they cannot be simultaneous, I guess. 
Uh, it probably depends on kind of size of group and the different expertise um, and people's just bandwidth with this. In my mind, there is benefit to doing them at the same time, or at least if not at the same time, at least with a planning to be somewhat concurrent, because I suspect uh, digitizing your lab in terms of data, sample management will inform how you choose to automate things and what your automated processes will look like. I also suspect that the type of automation that you end up buying or investing in will inform how your digital systems will look like. So a bit like what was mentioned. So there's not, I guess there's no perfect way to do it, but in my mind, if you have the bandwidth, there's no reason why you can at least have two teams start the process simultaneously. I think one because of especially if you're starting small on the automation, right? If, if you don't see it as this huge bear moth of, oh, we need to automate everything end to end, then it means that you can have aspects of this and, and start learning these critical skills as you go. So you have a bit of parallelization. I think first off, Marcus, clearly you were right. We take one question, we run with it. So <laughs> it's good just to do, maybe to do one more. But I think one other thing too, is that it doesn't necessarily have to be a decision made in silo, right? Within your group, consult the vendors who are working with you on those digital solutions, consult the automation vendors as well, right? And ask them what they've seen within the market and working with other customers and what works best. I think that's a great way of gathering information because realistically, they have quite a breadth um, and reach into various customers in the market who are doing different things. And so they can give you a good amount of information. Yeah, I think that's really, this is why we're doing this webinar now, right? We have the privilege of being able to see into a lot of people's change management processes, a lot of people's automation journeys and so being able to relay the general learnings that we see from these things, obviously without talking about specifics, then I think that can be uh, super helpful. I think just one last uh, thought that occurs to me in, in, in answer to this uh, question is there are different values that we're talking about here as well, right? So overall lab digitization that has a particular goal in mind and particular values of, uh, you know, getting, uh, you know, decent decently captured structured data, essentially at the end of the day, and putting that into the context of the experiments that are being run. Automation can help with this, but it, then it has a whole other set of values, which Luke was going in, into in, in his slide, where we were looking at the bench from the top down of all of the different things, which can be a problem with manual work, which you can essentially address with automation. So I think when you're looking at prioritization, then it's going to be that typical kind of cost benefit analysis of which of these are most important to you, right? If you do have to do these things sequentially, then uh, what value is most important to your organization at that particular point? And you can force rank your uh, priorities as a result um, is, is probably my final thought on it. Okay. I think actually that's probably a fairly decent place to wrap up. Thank you very much uh, for submitting your questions. Uh, thank you very much to Luke and Anne for having random questions fired at you and dealing with them uh, with uh, such a plot. We hope you enjoyed today's talk and look forward to seeing you for the next one. Bye, everybody. Bye.